Good morning. Good morning. I am sitting here with Phyllis Mundy, a uh, representative from the 120th District, Luzerne County, who served from 1991 to 2014. Thank you so much for being with me today. My pleasure. I'd like to start out by asking you uh, about some of your background. Um, tell me about where you grew up. Uh, tell me about your schooling and some of your first jobs. Um, my family was originally from Evansville, Indiana. Um, my dad's family were farmers in Princeton, Indiana, and my dad um, went to business school, couldn't wait to get off of the farm and all the hard labor involved, and um, ended up being the manager of a furniture manufacturing company in Evansville. Um, when I was about 12, my dad changed jobs and the family moved to Kingston, Pennsylvania. And uh, my dad ran Nelson Furniture Manufacturing Company in Kingston. And so, you know, most of my formative years were spent in a very traditional uh, middle class family. I have three sisters. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom, um, active in our church and did some volunteer work, but mostly a stay-at-home mom who took us to dance classes and music lessons and all of those types of things. Um, went to school in Kingston. It was the Kingston school system at that point, Kingston High School. I graduated from there in 1966. It was the last Kingston High School graduating class before a merger, which became Wyoming Valley West School District. And um, after graduating in 1966, I went to Bloomsburg State College and graduated from there with a degree in secondary education French mm -hmm. in 1970. I taught very briefly. Um, there really weren't very many jobs available in my, my field at that point. Um, languages were on the decline in the high schools. And um, so I did a lot of, so after my regular teaching job, um, which was in the Blue Ridge School District, it was such a rural community, there really wasn't much for me, a single mm -hmm. young woman, uh, to entertain myself after school. Um, I got married um, and moved back to Kingston. Um, I had a son shortly after I got married, about a year later. I was the mother of a, a toddler, a little boy, Brian, who is my only child. And um, I did some substitute teaching while he was little and my mom took care of him. Um, and then um, when he was in kindergarten, I stayed home with him because it was a half day and the logistics mm -hmm. were just too difficult. So didn't like staying home. That was not me. Um, needed to be more active. Um, I, I did get divorced, um, probably about 1979. Um, and then, of course, had to go find some full-time employment. So I worked a variety of different jobs until I finally landed at Injection Molding Corporation, uh, for, um, a uh, plastics manufacturer, injection, injection molded plastics, and um, kind of was the girl Friday in the office, ended up managing the whole office as the company grew. It had been a startup, um, a very difficult startup, because those were the years when interest rates um, skyrocketed on all the capital equipment. Mm -hmm. So for the 10 years before I got elected, that's what I did. I managed um, all of the office affairs, the purchasing, the accounting, um, the personnel, the unemployment, the workers' comp, all of that. So brought all of that experience um, of 10 years worth of manufacturing to my legislative career. and. Um, so as the 10th year of my um, manufacturing career was in full swing and the company was doing fine, it was a great job, good benefits, um, and as difficult as it was at times with all of the difficulties in, in manufacturing at that point, 
um, we were doing quite well and I, I enjoyed the work. I, it was a very small team of owners and managers um, that I worked with. We were very close. We spent worlds of time together. And um, so here I am sitting in Injection Molding Corporation and I get this call um, from some friends who said, you know, Scott Dietrich is um, under indictment. We're looking for a Democrat to run against him and we want you to consider it. And these were mostly women friends, um, politically active women friends, but not in positions of authority or power by any means. So I said, you're crazy. What do I know? Um, I would backtrack a moment to say that I had always been um, throughout my, uh, once I became an adult, I had always been active in um, volunteer work. Mm -hmm. The Junior League of Wilkes-Barre, the League of Women Voters of the Greater Wilkes-Barre area. I was actually uh, president of the league at the time that this is all taking place. And you know, I, I really, the league was booming. We were doing great things. We were taking kids to the courthouse every year to teach them about county government. I, and I got to know a lot of local elected officials, county and state and local. So I suspect that that's why people were looking at me as a warm democratic body to run against this very popular incumbent uh, who was under indictment for insurance fraud. But I, my first reaction was, you're crazy. You know, I have no political aspirations at all. I enjoy my work with the League of Women Voters because it's about public policy and what makes good public mm -hmm. policy, about the environment and education and the things that I care about. But it's, it's not politics. What do I know about politics? So I rejected the idea, and people kept talking to me about it, you know, all through, I guess, 1989 and the beginning of 1990. Well, four days before the filing deadline for that election cycle, I got a call from Kevin Blom, who was my neighbor in the Wilkes-Barre, I think it's the 121st. Um, he was the sitting state rep. He called me and said, the Democrats need someone to run. We would like you to put your name on the ballot. We'll teach you everything you need to know. And if you work hard, you know, we'll give you as much support as we possibly can. So in four days, my friends and I um, got our nominating petitions filed. That election was really interesting because there were four people running against the incumbent, Scott yes. Dietrich, who was under indictment at the time. One was a woman. Um, so f a five-way Republican primary, one was a woman. And quite frankly, some of the Republican women were trying to convince me that there was no way I could win and that I really shouldn't um, run. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, you know, don't tell me I can't do something. So I decided that I was going to stay in the race. And um, as it turned out, all of 1990, Scott Dietrich was under indictment. And then the trial actually took place, I believe it was October, before the November election. Mm -hmm. And don't you know, he was convicted of 19 criminal charges, I believe two of which were felonies, which meant that he couldn't sit as a, as a state representative. The, the law prohibits that. So he couldn't be seated as the state rep, even if he won the election. So the Republicans in Luzerne County attempted to get him off of the ballot but the absentee ballots had already been mailed. So the courts ruled that he was not allowed to get off the ballot. But in the meantime, they had attempted to replace him with not the woman who came in second in the Republican primary, but the man who was the county, uh, com county commissioner, Jim Phillips, um, who came in third. Mm and overlooked Ann Vernon, who came in second. Well, the women were outraged. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think I got a lot of Republican women's support as a result of, of that, what they considered a betrayal. Um, here the, the woman comes in second and, and is overlooked in favor of a more politically connected man. Um, the women were not happy at all. And I, and I think I kept a lot of that Republican support over many, many years. Okay. Um, so here I am as um, a state rep, sort of having been in the right place at the right time and the circumstances, because truly I never would have won in a race against Scott Dietrich sure. had he not been convicted. I probably would not have won. So my first re-election was really the one everybody said, oh, she's only going to be one term. You know, there's no way um, that Republicans are going to vote for her. It's still a Republican district. So here I am in 1992 now running against um, Keith Coslett. And it was a very nasty campaign, very nasty. Um, the radio talk show host at the time on WILK radio um, just blasted me day in and day out for my support of public education. Um, you know, he, he, he was brutal. Um, but I was working hard. I was going out and meeting people. I was going to every event I could possibly find to get to know the people of my district. And I was working hard here in Harrisburg, getting, uh, I was, got a seat on the Education Committee and I was working hard at those issues. So 1992, I won in a landslide and really have won my elections ever since. Mm -hmm. 24 years worth, 12 elections. Nice. Um, going back a little bit, what would you say were your, inf or who would you say were your influences um, to becoming a Democrat? Oh, well, my family in Indiana and my, my extended family, my aunts and uncles and cousins, are all staunch Republicans. Oh, my. And my mom and dad had been Republicans. Um, and when I decided to run and called my father and told him that I was considering it, he said, well, you're going to run as a Republican, right? And I said, no, Dad, I'm going to run as a Democrat. I switched parties back in 1985. He said, oh, my gosh, so did I, um, which came as a complete surprise to me we, because we never discussed party politics. Mm -hmm. My dad and I had always discussed public policy but it was always in the context of what's good public policy. What benefits the middle class? How did we arrive at this middle class that we, we think should prosper? So that was our discussion. It was never about Republican versus Democrat. It was always who's going to do the right thing for the country, for the state, whatever. So he was surprised that I had switched. I was surprised that he had switched. But the reason that I switched was Ronald Reagan was president at the time and was engaged in what I believed was trickle-down supply-side economic policy, which I disapprove of, I disagree with. I don't think the notion that you just take care of the wealthiest among us in the hopes that they will give the rest of us jobs with good salaries and benefits, I don't think that works. Um, just recently on Facebook I saw a post that I totally agree with Corporations don't create jobs, consumers do. So, you know, I, I just totally disagreed with that economic policy. The moral majority was rampant at the time, trying to impose their moral values and views on everyone in the country, which I also disagreed with. Um, and so back in 1985, I switched to Democrat. Um, because I believed that the Republican Party no longer represented my views. And quite frankly, um, I still believe that the government should only do for people those things that it cannot do, they cannot do for themselves. Not those things they will not do for themselves. They refuse to do for themselves. But, and I believe that was the Republican philosophy back when I was a Republican. And somehow, um, the Republican Party has become so extreme that I could just no longer be a part of it. Sure. 
So I voted with my feet, as it were. Right. <laughs> you touched a little bit on campaigning. Um, was it easy at first, or did it get easier um, from campaign to campaign? It never got easy. No. Um, I, I would say for 12 elections, the Republicans were determined to take the seat back and put it back in their column. And, bec and I, you know, I'm not sure why they always felt that they needed to come after me. Um, there were very few elections where I didn't have an opponent or I didn't have to get somebody off of the ballot for bad petitions. Mm -hmm. I did that twice, um, had people removed from the ballot because their petitions were bad. Um, but I had very nasty elections in many, many of my races. Um, and I, I think part of that is because I did not hesitate to speak my mind about issues. I really felt as though if I was going to take a position, I need to explain to people why. And I think some people took offense to that. Um, I could never be the kind of a elected official that just went along to get along. I was not here just to collect a paycheck. I was here to do what I believed was right and let the political chips fall where they may, and they did fall. Right. Um, and over the years, I had many knockdown, drag out battles um, Blue Cross surplus medical malpractice, um, and many, many other issues. Um, but I think the people of my district always could see that I was trying to stand up for them, for the average middle class person, um, and try to do what I thought was right for them and for the benefit of all of society, not a particular group because they're powerful or connected, mm -hmm. but for everybody. Um, especially the most vulnerable. Um, I, I just believe that you can't just cast those folks aside. Right. Were there certain aspects of campaigning that you really enjoyed? There was one campaign that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, there were a group of students at Wyoming Valley West High School and a couple of students from Wyoming Area High School who formed a Students for Phyllis Mundy committee. Hmm. And that was so much fun, and, and really, I enjoyed that so thoroughly. Um, they did their own press releases. They did organize their own events. We passed out balloons at the football stadium one, one night, or a couple of nights, I guess, at the Wyoming area and the Wyoming Valley West football stadiums. I took them with me on door-to-door um, -door efforts, canvassing, and I tried to you know, the teacher in me, I think, you know, was in the forefront at that time because I really was trying to show them what, what politics should be like and what it is like. And I know especially there, was, there were a couple of uh, newspaper articles at the end of the campaign um, in two of our major newspapers. And I wrote... Um, I, I wrote letters to the kids pointing out the difference in how the articles were written and because they were part of this and, and I was being criticized for having involved them in the campaign. And the articles were really, um, in some cases, misinformation and not really portraying exactly what happened. And so I wanted to point that out to them that, you know, this is how journalism is. If you're looking to be a journalist, this is what you should avoid. Right. Be more diligent yeah. in how you interview or how you gather your facts. So the whole, the whole thing was, um, I thought, educational for them. And I did get some really, really positive feedback from the parents who really appreciated the, their, the kids' involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I had a blast. I just, that was the most, the only fun campaign I ever had. <laughs> Great. Um, tell me about your district, uh, both uh, geographically and the people. Well, I, geographically, it is the west side of the Susquehanna River across the river from Wilkes-Barre City. 
Um, it stretches, it, well, it's stretched all the way from Kingston down to West Pittston and up around the bend in the river up into Exeter Township, mm -hmm. Harding. And then there were some back mountain communities. Um, and over the years, it changed somewhat. In the beginning, it was gerrymandered to be a Republican district. And over the next two reapportionments, we made it more compact, more contiguous, and really um, brought together the communities of interest um, in the district. There are four school districts, Wyoming Valley West, Wyoming area, uh, Dallas, and Lake Lehman. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I only represented one community from each of Dallas and Lake Lehman. And the bulk of my district was in uh, Wyoming Valley West and Wyoming area. So um, tree-lined streets, um, pockets of poverty, but generally um, middle-class, hard-working people, a lot of elderly citizens, um, really salt-of-the-earth folks who work hard every day, a lot of veterans who served in World War II and Korea and Vietnam. Um, just really, really good people um, who are working hard every day. Nice. Were there certain issues with the people in your district that um, would be considered unique compared to some of the other areas in Pennsylvania? I don't think really unique. Okay. Um, I really don't. Um, you know, a state rep's office, we are the closest to the people in the state legislature. And because we have district offices, People bring us federal, county, state, local government issues all the time. And if somebody walked into the, to the district office, even though they might not have been my constituent, we tried to help whatever issue it was, whether it was, we didn't we try not to jerk people around by sending them hither, thither, and yon, or asking them to call so-and-so. We would try to solve their problems. And, um, I think the, the issues there are pretty much is, issues um, statewide. We do have, I think, some underemployment, but I don't think that's terribly unique to our district. Um, I think there, there are a lot of issues, I think, that are property taxes because of the elderly population is probably a big issue. But just in general, I think the issues of my district are the issues of the people of Pennsylvania. So 1991, you're elected for the first time. Um, can you tell me about your first impressions of Harrisburg, the capital, your swearing in ceremony? It's a blur. <laughs> it's a blur. Um, that first swearing in, I, I'm sure I brought people down from home who participated in my first campaign. But I really don't remember much of that day. It was really overwhelming, really overwhelming. Um, the magnificence of this building, the, all the flowers on the house floor, and people jam-packed into that and onto the house floor to support their friends it was really um, a blur. Yeah. Was there anyone um, who took you under their wing, any mentors? Um, I have to say that the Democratic state reps that surrounded me were, were very helpful, okay. very helpful um, in the beginning. Tom Tighe, Kevin Blom, mostly, I would say, and, and I would ask advice of them. And they gave me some very good advice and helped me avoid, I think, some pitfalls early on. So, um, yes. Over the years, um, my roommate in Harrisburg, Kathy Mandarino, uh, and I were very simpatico. Um, even though our districts were quite different, she was from Philadelphia, has since retired. Um, but we were together as roomies for 18 years yeah. and um, spent a lot of time together, as you can imagine, after, after sure. session. So I don't know that I consider her a mentor. I guess we mentored each other. Um, and Dwight Evans, I would have to say, um, has been extremely helpful to me when he was appropriations chairman. 
and um, a good friend uh, that I could always go to for advice. And there have been many, many other people that I look up to, and Bill Lloyd comes to mind. Um, but, but many, many uh, colleagues who I look to, mostly on the issue of, of you know, it depends on which issue you're looking sure. at at the time. Um, how was your first office setting? Um, did you share an office? Did you have your own I did. Office? Over the years, I shared um, office space with Pat Carone, with Steve Stetler. Um, I had several office mates over the years. Um, now, of course, having served, what, eight years as a committee chairman, uh, first in aging and then in um, finance, I have had my own big office with office staff attached okay. to me. So big changes? Um, yeah. yeah. I, you know, being, being a committee chairman is a huge responsibility. Sure. <clears throat> Especially, in fact, you would think that the, the, the responsibility would be the greatest in the majority. Mm -hmm. But I felt an even greater responsibility in the minority because we were kept in the dark until the last minute. Um, we would find out a week or two before a committee meeting that we were going to be voting on a bill. Very complex matter. We'd never had a hearing on it. Had no idea what was coming up, what amendments might be offered. Sure. And to, to inform the members of my minority side about what the issues were, um, what the controversies might be within the bill, um, I saw that as a tremendous responsibility. And really, as a majority committee chairman, I was majority committee chairman for aging. Mm -hmm. um, we did some good work. Um, I think my biggest accomplishment there was my assisted living licensure bill. Um, well, I worked with Pat Vance, Senator Pat Vance in the Senate. And we got that done. They had been working to try to get assisted living licensure for 12 years and had never been able to accomplish it. The interest groups were just sure. at war. And finally, we did accomplish that um, when I was minor majority chairman of, of aging. Um, and, and we did a lot of good work, but it was always at our own pace. Mm -hmm. And, and honestly, you know, I, I like to think that as a majority committee chairman, I was more courteous to my minority members by giving them as much advance notice as possible, by having hearings on, on issues that were controversial or issues that were um, complicated mm -hmm. so that they had a better understanding of what it was they were voting on, um, which I was not afforded in the minority, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Well, speaking of committees, you had served on, as you mentioned, education and professional licensure, aging, finance. Appropriations. Appropriations, a number of them throughout the years. Right. Um, and then, of course, chair of, of a couple of them. Uh, were there any that, uh, that you would say were your favorite or that you were able to accomplish the most? Um, I, my, I think my favorite was appropriations. Oh, okay. Probably because that's where, if you sit at the Appropriations Committee hearings day in and day out for the two to three weeks that they are conducted. You have come before you every state agency. You get to listen to all kinds of questions um, asked by other members that give you a tremendous understanding of state government, how it works, what the fiscal issues involved are, how the agencies spend their money, what kind of programming is available for constituents. It was, well, I think I was on it for 10 years. I'm not totally sure exactly how many years um, I served on appropriations. But Dwight Evans um, would, I think, maybe, I don't think I'm embarrassing him to say that he might get a little bored sitting there day after day. So he would task me with sitting next to whoever the majority chairman of appropriations was um, and kind of I, so I was really stuck there all the time day in and day out um, but it was a tremendous education in state government oh, I'm sure some members have said in the past that um, it's in the committee that a lot of the work gets done do you agree with that well 
I, I had to laugh. Um, in this past election, um, my friend Eileen Cipriani was running against a Republican Aaron Coffer, and at the debate, he suggested that why should, why should legislation be written in committee or behind closed doors? It should be written on the full house floor. And I'm thinking, <laughs> that would be impossible. Um, it's hard enough to try to amend a bill on the house floor, but to craft legislation on the house floor? Clearly, the young man has a lot to learn. Um, Yes, the, the work of the committees is crucial. And, and as majority chairman of the aging committee, I took that so seriously. Mm -hmm. We would get to committee and find that there was an issue that we hadn't thought about. So we would pull the bill for another week or so. We would meet with the minority side, with any interest groups who had problems with the language. And we would try to refine it and try to come to consensus about how the bill should look, make sure there were no unintended consequences. Um, the, many committees don't do that, and they don't do that the way they should. Um, we would hold public hearings to make sure that, that we got a lot of input as to what some of these unintended consequences might be. Yeah. Um, and, and I was very diligent, I must say, as a, as a committee chairman, especially in the majority. And in the minority, um, I would raise issues about language in the bill. And often, I mean, just recently in a finance committee meeting, we got, this was just within the last month or two, we got to the committee meeting we're supposed to vote, and my staff and I had uncovered a potential unintended consequence having to do with the funding of the Philadelphia school system. Mm. And so right there in committee, we suggested a verbal amendment, um, which had to be agreed to by both sides, and it was. Right. Um, so that's the work of the committee. That could have gotten to the House floor and gotten totally thrown off, th or maybe never even brought up for a vote to solve the problem that was in the underlying bill because of that unintended consequence. So the work of the committees is crucial. Um, people need to be really engaged in their committee work. Uh, get as much input as they possibly can from the interest groups. And, you know, this, that brings to mind uh, something that, that people sit, talk a lot about, and that is special interests. Every single person who ever walked through my door in Harrisburg or back in the district office has a special interest in whatever issue they're bringing to me. There are legitimate special interests and you need to listen to all of it then it's our job as legislators to sort through all of that to figure out what makes good public policy what is the best thing to do here um, and I, I really get frustrated with some of the framing um, that goes on uh, special interests are legitimate the, the trial lawyers have an interest in medical malpractice and physicians mm -hmm. and patients and nurses. Everybody has an interest. People who, who uh, work within any healthcare system and, and the general public all have special interests mm -hmm. involved in that legislation. And again, you know, you, you listen to all of it and then you have to do what you think is right. Would you say that a lot of the bills that you personally introduced were constituent-based? There were many of them that were constituent-based, yes. Um, and some of them I had put into law through the amendment process mm -hmm. um, that will never have my name on them, and probably very few people will ever know that I had anything to do with it. But yes, um, constituents would bring me issues and I would offer legislation or try to amend another bill right. to address it. Um, but I have to say that some of the, the legislation that I am most proud of and felt most passionate about um, had to do with 
preventing problems that I see that are preventable. Okay. And I would, I would offer as an example is my ounce of prevention bill. Yes. Nurse home visiting for at-risk mothers about to give birth. And nurse home visiting is um, the, a registered nurse or a, a home visitor, a qualified home visitor, uh, versed in early childhood and prenatal and, and birth and eight, zero to three benchmarks, mm -hmm. um, goes into the home and mentors a young mother and, and her family. Um, maybe she's married, maybe she's not. Maybe she has a, a significant other that is part of the, the uh, situation. Maybe she lives with her parents, but, but the nurse home visitor, the home visitor goes into the home and mentors the family. And that has proven in all the studies that have been done to be so preventive. It prevents child abuse. It prevents... Um, dependency in a lot of cases it's an investment in the future of that child because zero to three is where the brain is wired your intellectual capacity is formed in those early years right. and um, the poverty situations and the disadvantaged situations that occur leave children um, coming to kindergarten and first grade not ready for school and they never catch up Mm -hmm. So, the longitudinal studies have shown the remarkable, remarkable results of programs like that. And it's in our law now. Mm -hmm. My ounce of prevention bill did become law. Not the way I wrote it. Mm. There were significant compromises. And it's a budget line item that we have to fight for every single year. But um, it is the law and hopefully we can build on it. Um, another other issues that um, I feel very passionately about had to do with foster children's kids who are removed from their family home through no fault of their own many of whom because of the situation that they were living in have a lot of baggage a lot of negative deficits um, and making sure that they get the best care possible that they get the services they need to become productive adults again. It's about prevention. Mm -hmm. You know, we can spend all the money we want on incarceration, all the money we want on drug and alcohol treatment. Why not invest and try to prevent those kinds of problems? But most of those are new investments, um, and there aren't a lot of interest groups built up that have power around those issues. Mm -hmm. And so it's been an uphill battle. But um, it's work that I'm very proud of. And, and I would say of all the issues that I've ever dealt with, even though I don't serve on children and youth, even though you know um, those were kind of outside of my so-called areas of expertise sure. with my committees, um, it was the work that I was most passionate about and cared about the most. Great. How difficult is it to get a bill passed? I know it's a, it's a pretty broad question, but... Well, you know, I, I find that um, these discussions about the size of the legislature mm -hmm. um, are interesting. On the one hand, it would address what you just asked me. Mm -hmm. The legislative process here in Harrisburg is very cumbersome. With 203 members, um, in the House and 50 state senators and the bills of course having to pass in identical forms uh, to get to the governor's desk the, the the process is very cumbersome and with the smaller legislature it would be less cumbersome um, but the people of Pennsylvania in our diversity mm -hmm. the urban areas like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Allentown, Harrisburg uh, York, I mean, and then all of the rural areas in between, they would not have the voice that they currently have because their legislator is more uh, concentrated in that area. Um, on the other hand, the constituent service aspect 
Um, if we were to go to a part-time legislature, very few part-time legislatures have district offices at all. Mm. Um, legislators go to, go to their state capitol for a month, a few weeks, maybe periodically through the year, but they don't go back into their districts and serve constituents. That's left up to the bureaucracies. Right. And one of, one of the very important things that I think we did in our district offices for people was to get right to the heart of the matter, cut through the red tape, go right to the person who can help solve that problem for a constituent. And it really, I think it's why we have one of the fewest uh, or lowest number of public employees per capita as any state in the nation. It used to be the lowest, 50th, but I think it's now 49th, something like that. But that's why, I think, is because your district office does the work for the constituent. We are their advocate. Um, sometimes the answer is no, but we do our best to try to get to the heart of the problem. Um, and by doing that, it exposes issues that need to be dealt with legislatively. So um, it's very informative mm -hmm. when constituents come to you with those kinds of problems. Yeah. Getting back to some of the, the items that you were most proud, um, the hoarding of excess surplus in, in Blue Cross, um, how did that come about and how did you get involved with that? Well, I noticed that Blue Cross was raising their rates in the double digits year in and year out while at the same time um, there were lawsuits. Um, and this was in 2005. Oh, don't pin me down okay. on the year, please. But um, that was when I first got involved. It, it actually uh, kind of evolved over several years and was a major focus for me over those years. But um, they had more surplus than they, they I thought, were entitled to mm -hmm. at the same time that they're raising rates in double digits. Um, and they're nonprofits and especially established to be nonprofit insurance companies. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, they're raising rates, they're hoarding surplus. They also established a multi-million dollar foundation using ratepayer funds to give away grants within um, the region. Mm. Well, th that's Blue Cross of Northeast PA anyway. So. You know, I, I, I'm getting calls and letters about people not able to afford these increases. So I began to delve into the issue and um, worked with some of the, the lawyers involved in the class action lawsuits, started reading the um, financial forms that have to be filed with the IRS and state and local government, or state and federal government. And the more I learned, the more I was aghast at what was going on. So <clears throat> I did work on that um, for many years. Yeah. Um, and it was sort of a David and Goliath kind of. Um, and again, you know, people were saying, oh, Blue Cross, they're coming after you, you know. And couldn't just sit there and not do something yeah. about what I thought was wrong. So in the end, um, the insurance commissioner of Pennsylvania did cap the surplus in the sense that she said, at this level of surplus, nothing happens. This is appropriate. At this level, you cannot include risk and contingency okay. in your rates. At this level, you've got to reduce your surplus. Mm. So. That was one outcome, but another outcome was, um, I think, as a result of my op-ed pieces, the testimony that I provided in, in different areas, I think Blue Cross felt somewhat um, the need to start negotiating with the Rendell administration and did then fund adult basic using 2% of their premium funds because okay. they don't pay the premium tax that other insurance companies pay. Right. But that, that expired, that, that agreement that with the Rendell administration expired, so then Adult Basic went away under the Corbett administration. 
but I'm not sure that would have happened if it hadn't been um, for some of the work that I did. Good. Uh, another big issue in Pennsylvania now is Marcellus Shale. Um, how has it impacted your district? And if it has, has it led you to introduce legislation? Well, <clears throat> the, there is no active drilling in my district. Okay. But there are a lot of leases that had been issued um, in my district mm -hmm. in the in the Back Mountain area. Um, and you know you try to get ahead of an issue, but it really kind of, I think it got way ahead of the legislature in the sense that these, these land, uh, land agents, I'm not, I can't remember exactly what you call them, but they would go out and try to get people to sign these leases so that at some point in the future they might drill. And when I became aware, you know, I mean, I, I'm looking at my map and I'm seeing all these leases around the drinking water reservoirs owned by the water company and I'm thinking the buffer just is not adequate I mean what if there's a spill what if there's a puncture uh, you know the drilling punctures the side of the reservoir this could be very dangerous so I offered a piece of legislation that would have put a moratorium for a year until we could get a handle on it moratorium on new permits being issued um, for a year. Well, of course, that was going nowhere because people were already making money. Uh, landowners were getting royalties, and um, and the Marcello shale industry, of course, is making lots of money from. And and really, the northern tier is where most of the um, the drilling is taking place. Mm -hmm. But my district is impacted in the sense that our drinking water is threatened. Right. I think, and. Um, the buffers are not adequate around the reservoirs. And for me, it was an issue of environmental quality, air, land, and water. So um, I proposed numerous pieces of legislation to deal with the regulatory issues um, and, and really fought hard to get them incorporated into law. And um, the severance tax, the issue of a severance tax, where the, insur or the uh, Marcellus Shale companies, the drillers, pay uh, an extraction tax for the privilege of taking Pennsylvania's natural resources. Um, it's galling that for, I mean, my house is heated by gas, and my gas bill includes a severance tax from wherever that gas came from for all the years before they started drilling the Marcellus Shale. Mm -hmm. And to this, this point in time, I'm sure I still get gas from Oklahoma, Louisiana, Texas. We pay their extraction tax, but we Pennsylvanians don't get the benefit of a mm -hmm. severance tax, an extraction tax. And we should. Um, we're going to be exporting um, the Marcellus Shale gas, natural gas. Um, ports have been established to do that. They're going to liquefy it and ship it overseas. In addition to piping it all over, mm -hmm. um, New Jersey, New York, and other places. So I believe that Pennsylvania should get its share yeah. of those funds, and we certainly need the new revenue. Sure. Um, in 2006, uh, when the uh, Democrats gained the majority, um, you were elected caucus secretary and then some things had happened and um, Dennis O'Brien was elected speaker um, a Republican a Republican correct um, and then you stepped down uh, from that leadership position can you tell me about that well I so sort of got pushed out um, because everybody moved back one you know Bill DeWeese was supposed to be the speaker and then Mike Vion was supposed to be the majority leader and the deal was that we would keep all of our committee chairmanships in the majority as and Denny O'Brien would be the speaker so you know Dwight Evans always used to say to me Phyllis you're a leader in spite of yourself and unfortunately I think he's right because I really he's the one who encouraged me to be a part of the leadership team um, and I ran somewhat reluctantly because I really enjoyed my committee work. 
And as a member of the leadership team, you don't serve on committees. And I knew that I would miss that a lot. I mean, public policy is, is my forte. You know, and frankly, I'm not sure there should even be secretaries in the caucuses. We really serve no specific function. You know, many secretaries have kind of crafted their own, uh, their own mission, mm -hmm. but we don't really need a caucus secretary. Um, it's more pro forma than anything else. Um, and it gives, you know, one more person that opportunity to be a part of the team. So I must say that's when I became chairman of the aging committee, which mm -hmm. I, I thoroughly enjoyed my aging committee chairmanship, much more than I would have enjoyed being uh, caucus secretary. So it wasn't such a hard thing to uh, step back. So you had no plans then of running for another leadership position after that? Um, there were many discussions um, of people who wanted me to run because there were no women in our leadership team. And, and I sort of felt an obligation to try to represent women in that sense. But I really, from my own personal perspective, the public policy work, again, was what I wanted to do. It was what I enjoyed, sorting through all those special interests, sorting through you know, the legislation, crafting legislation, trying to make it, refine it, and make sure that it does what it's supposed to do and that it's a good thing. And so, no, I really never aspired to leadership beyond that. Okay. Uh, with regards to seniority in the House, um, did you find it that it affected you one way or another, um, whether you were just starting out as a freshman in your first years, or even later on when you were, when you were part of the seniority? Um, well, obviously, your seniority makes a huge difference as you become a committee chairman, because we, we actually have a House rule that says you can't ignore seniority when you select committee chairman. Okay. Um, so I was very pleased. I mean, it took me 18 years to get to be a committee chairman, but really seniority is helpful because of your institutional knowledge. Having been here for 24 years, I have seen an awful lot. I have worked on an awful lot of issues. I've served on many, many different committees. Um, appropriations, as I said, which is enormously helpful in terms of knowing this institution. So, you know, I, that's the work I have enjoyed. And um, without seniority, would I ever have been? I would have been a committee chairman, I'm pretty sure. I think, actually, I really enjoyed my aging committee very much mm -hmm. and thought I was very productive there. And um, when Dave Levdansky lost his election, Frank Dermody came to me and said, Phyllis, would you take finance? I thought, oh, finance. Not, never been one of my favorite topics or, you know, tax policy, which is the, go the mission of the Finance Committee as opposed to appropriation, which is the budget and money in, money out. Um, finance, tax policy, I obviously have opinions about it and uh, know quite a lot about it, um, but it was never my favorite thing. But I delved right in and mm -hmm. took up uh, the issue of tax fairness, both from the property tax perspective and corporate taxes. Um, and I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed being finance committee chairman. Um, it would have been nice to be the majority finance mm -hmm. committee chairman. I think people don't realize the importance of who is in the majority. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's been interesting to me, the, there is a group of people back in the district who are just incensed over property taxes, and rightfully so. But the, the, one of the leaders of that group keeps um, really haranguing me about the fact that I did not co-sponsor 
House Bill 76, which was a bill to switch from property to sales and income. Mm -hmm. It's basically a property tax elimination bill. Um, and he was incensed that I would not co-sponsor that bill. Well, the bill was horribly crafted um, and left a huge funding gap um, in terms of the money that we would be losing in the property tax and the money that would be replacing uh, that property tax with sales and income. There was a huge gap of over a billion dollars. Well, but I totally acknowledge that that is a huge problem, property taxes, and I wanted to do something about moving the issue forward. So I voted against tabling the bill in committee, mm -hmm. but it was tabled by the Republican majority with some Democratic votes, yes, but the Republican majority offered the amendment, sure. or the motion, I should say, to table it. And then it came up on the House floor as an amendment to another bill this session and was overwhelmingly defeated, but I voted for it. And the guy is still furious with me because I didn't co-sponsor the bill, because that's more important right. than voting for it. And you cannot convince them that though the people in the majority are the people who control the legislative agenda. Even if I was the biggest proponent in the whole wide world of House Bill 76, I am powerless to bring it up for a vote. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, but I think people don't understand. And, and frankly, it, it's interesting to me that they overwhelmingly elected um, Tom Wolf as governor and then literally tied his hands with a super majority of Republicans in the House and Senate. And you, you, but I think it's indicative of the fact that they just don't understand the power that the majority party in the House and Senate have mm. to completely control the agenda. Mm. Um, speaking of which, during your time in the House, did you have a good relationship with members of the Senate or even the governor's office? Well, um, during the, the Casey years, I had a good working relationship. Um, I butted heads with the Ridge administration over subsidized child care, which they cut dramatically at one point. And again, that was a crusade for me. I just couldn't see how it benefits anyone to have low-income working women have to quit their job and go on welfare because they can't afford child care. Um, so I went on a crusade to get him to reverse that decision and ultimately he did restore some of those cuts but it did not go back to where it had been. Mm -hmm. But he and I really and his uh, Secretary of Welfare and I butted heads over that issue um, repeatedly, term after term, until he reversed it. So, you know, I had my issues with, with the Schwe Ridge Schweiker administration. And then I have to say my favorite administration to do business with. And of course, keep in mind that now I'm more senior, more knowledgeable, and able to work the system a little better, but I loved the Rendell administration. Um, and the wonderful um, agency heads that he surrounded himself with. People who were really truly concerned about the environment. Truly concerned with good public education. Um, and those were the hallmarks I think of his administration were the wonderful uh, state agency heads that he appointed. Really knowledgeable, hard-working people who were there to solve problems. Um, the Senate, there are, uh, as I said, I worked with Senator Vance, mm -hmm. um, and we tried, you know, my committee, aging committee, was the counterpart of her aging and youth okay. in the Senate. So we worked closely together on several issues. Um, and the assisted living bill, we worked together on and actually got that done together. I worked uh, with Senator Pat Brown for the whole time I've been here, the whole time he was originally in the House and then moved to the Senate, and we worked on early childhood education issues. We formed the Early Childhood Education Caucus, which is the largest caucus in the House and Senate. It's bicameral, bipartisan, and the biggest caucus, um, and you know we break up into mm -hmm. different interest caucuses. 
it's the largest one and are very proud of the work that we've done. Okay. To bring in the partners that we worked with, Fight Crime Invest in Kids, Mission Readiness, the military, um, Early Learning Investment Commission, the business community, mm. um, to bring all the partners together, the, the child care providers, the people interested in early childhood like Pennsylvania Partnerships for Children and Penn AC, um, brought all those people together to work on those nice. on the early childhood education issues. So Pat and I are very close um, in terms of working together and, and trying to accomplish uh, our goal of moving moving the early childhood agenda forward. Good. Did you have a good relationship with the media, both in Harrisburg and in your district? You know, I, I had an excellent working relationship, um, and they called me very frequently. And again, because I have a big mouth and I wasn't afraid <laughs> to say what I thought. Um, and I think th that's one reason why they would call me a lot, because they knew that, if, especially if they caught me at a time when the issue was hot, <laughs> that I might say something slightly provocative, <laughs> which is probably one of my political downfalls, you know. Um, leave it to me to bring gasoline to the fire, as it were. Right. Um, but um, I, I did have a good working relationship with the media. I can only point to one time where I felt ill-used. And that was um, not a local paper, actually. That was the Harrisburg Patriot News. Um, that quoted me as saying the people just don't get it out of context. Mm -hmm. And this was after the financial meltdown, global economic meltdown, where we were struggling to craft a budget. And my constituents were asking me for more money for this and more money for that and don't cut this and don't cut that. And we had no revenue. So there were proposals out there to raise the personal income tax for a short period of time to get us past this economic meltdown. And the point I was making to the, the reporter was people don't understand that there is no more money. Right. And that if we're going to put more money into any of these line items, we'll have to raise taxes somewhere. But it, I certainly wasn't promoting that notion at that sure. point in time. I was simply stating the fact. There is no money. If you want more money for X, then it's going to have to come from new revenue. It can't come from existing cuts. Right. And the way he placed my comment in the article, it made it sound like the people just don't get it. We have to raise taxes. Well, that's not what I said. And we were inundated in my district office. Well, I, more in Harrisburg, in my Harrisburg office, because mm -hmm. the radio talk shows here in Harrisburg picked it up and were telling people to call me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so that, you know, I, but I must say that in all my 24 years, um, I did not feel ill used by the media except for that one instance. Good. Um, currently, Pennsylvania ranks 38th in the country. Um, in terms of women in state legislatures. Uh, about 18% of Pennsylvania's legislature is women. Why do you think it's so low, and, and can anything be done to increase female representation? Well, there are a lot of organizations that support women candidates. Um, I have to say that I do believe that there is gender bias in the, vo in the voting population. Some women um, see a slate of candidates and pick the woman to vote for. Mm -hmm. Some people ignore gender and vote on, based on the issues and the stands on issues that mm -hmm. people take. And I have to tell you that um, from my perspective, I don't see very much difference between the men and the women on the Republican side of the aisle when it comes to public policy. Mm. They all line up like soldiers and vote the same way. It's rare that one will break ranks yeah. on what I consider to be a woman's issue. So, t 
to, I wish voters would concentrate on issues and what they think is good economic policy, mm -hmm. good public policy for all of Pennsylvania, as opposed to whether they vote for a man or a woman. Because I don't, again, I don't think that matters as much when it comes to public policy. Um, and, and I'll point to one issue that I, uh, it's never been a, the most burning issue for me, but it's pay equity, mm -hmm. where the notion that men make more uh, cents on the dollar than women do for, the, for doing the same work. And we as, you know, there, there is a woman's caucus ladies of the house or some such thing um, and I think there has been an effort to try to work together to move that issue forward but in the end I don't see the Republican women being willing to tell an employer you have to pay a woman the same amount that you pay a man so where are you going with the issue unless you do that I, I really kinda don't get it mm -hmm. and I don't um, I, I'm not sure that there are many issues that we can really work together on when it comes to things like that because there is this basic ideological difference between the R's and the D's. Um, the majority of, of um, minimum wage workers are women, but I don't see an effort on the R side to raise the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So. Uh. It's problematic, and, and you know, so I support organizations that um, promote women that I ha have policy similarities with. Mm -hmm. Do you think that women have made strides, though, over the 24 years that you've, that you've been here? Well, the Republican, the, the Republican women have increased their ranks. Mm -hmm. We haven't so much as Democrats. Um, and, and there, I think the, the fact that we're full time and a lot of women have young children or elderly parents that they're caring for back home. Women still do the majority of the housework. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, family circumstances and jobs, the kinds of jobs that a lot of women have don't lend themselves to campaigning full time or um, Raise, being able to raise enough money to sure. mount a campaign. You mentioned about the, the, the policy differences on either side of the aisle. Um, is it difficult to work with the other side of the aisle in terms of, of not just trying to get things done, but even you know, camaraderie and, and friendship? Or do, do, does the policy really dictate that? Um, well, where I've been closest to working with my Republican counterparts has been on my committees. Okay. And as I said, um, I worked very hard to, in, to give my Republican members, when I was a majority chairman, the time to raise issues, step back, work together, reach consensus to try to move an issue forward. And Tim Hennessy and I, who he was my uh, Republican chairman when I was majority chairman of aging, we used to laugh a lot about the kumbaya moments that we mm -hmm. had because we frequently would vote unanimously on a bill at the end of that process. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the House floor and it would be no problem at all to get it passed unanimously, again because we had worked so hard to do it right. Um, then we come to finance. <laughs> And Carrie Benninghoff is my, minor, my majority chairman on finance. I've never been majority chairman of finance. And it started out that um, I was very annoyed at the lack of um, lead time that we would get on a bill, especially a complex bill um, or a controversial bill. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be prepared to offer amendments in a certain time frame in order to have them considered at the committee meeting. And it was almost as though they were deliberately letting us know at the last possible moment so that we couldn't offer amendments. We didn't have time to come up with amendments. And I remember actually having to stand up on the House floor one day 
to ask Carrie Benninghoff publicly what are we going to be voting on at this meeting that you're calling off of the House floor? Because I hadn't even gotten the courtesy of a heads up mm -hmm. so that I could tell my members what to expect, let alone have the opportunity to read the bill, try to amend the bill, or anything else. Even though what, what the, was in a bill that we would be right. voting on, I had no agenda for this meeting whatsoever. But I think um, House Bill 76... Carrie and I and other uh, Republican members of the Finance Committee kind of bonded over that issue because we were being lambasted by these statewide property uh, tax groups um, who wrongly believed that I was 100% opposed to the notion. Um, and, but um, there was actually this photoshopped photo online on on their website these statewide property tax people um, I was Ma Barker with a, <laughs> a Gatling gun and arrayed behind me were Mike Terzai, Carrie Benninghoff, Eli Ivankovich and Seth Grove and so St Seth and I still joke that you know he's one of my boys <laughs> Ma Barker and her boys. And I mean, the notion that I would be the leader of these four people arrayed behind me is just laughable. Um, because we haven't, dis we haven't agreed on very much um, over the, the time that we've been on the um, Finance Committee. But I, I do think that things improved as a result of that. Right. We, we bonded as... Um, sort of in, in recognition that we were all being tarred and feathered, sure. right, rightly or wrongly, um, for, you know, having a difference with this one group. So we laughed and joked, and, and I think Carrie, and because, again, you know, I mean, I would come to committee meetings and raise valid points. Mm -hmm. And Carrie would then sometimes actually pull a bill and we would reconsider it. But that was an evolution process. You know, it was um, something that evolved, not something that we started out doing. So I think in the end, Carrie and I um, have become better friends and work together better. And now, of course, I'm retiring. And so he actually called the committee together to wish me a, a farewell, and that, which was very nice. Very nice. So we, um, but it, it's tough. We are so ideologically, uh, people are so polarized today, the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, I think the Republicans have gone so far to the right that it makes even the moderates among us, and I consider myself a moderate. I'm downright libertarian in some respects, um, but I'm perceived as being a liberal, a left-wing liberal, um, and really, I'm where I was back in 1985 when I switched parties. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I still find quotes from Dwight Eisenhower that I totally agree with, um, warning us about the, the uh, military complex and, and you know, its dangerous aspects. So it, it's been distressing to me to see how far right... Um, the Republican Party has moved, and I think it's pushed the rest of us to the right as well. Yeah. Do you see anyone on, on the other side as, a, as an antagonist or uh, an enemy almost um, during your time here? I, there have been a couple of people who, um, when I would stand up on the House floor and offer comments about a bill for or against, would literally stand up and ridicule um, the lady from Luzerne doesn't understand, whatever. I, I can't be too specific at the moment. And I did take offense at that because my, my remarks were never in the, in the beginning. I mean, then I would have to fight back, of course. Right. Um, but my remarks in the beginning were never personal. Mm -hmm. It was always about public policy. I never had any intention of vilifying a person on the other side of the issue. But um, 
there have been people who've done that to me and who I then would, you know, feel adversarial toward when they would stand up and make a comment that I felt was not true, mm -hmm. what, that's not what the bill said, that's not what the bill did, that I would feel the need to kind of fight back. And I did. Good. Did it make it difficult to, to have friendships after hours uh, because of the differences between the two on the floor? Yes. Yeah. Um, there are people that I avoid like the plague. <laughs> um, yes. I would say that's true. And there are people, um, you know, I, I want to just touch on the issue of caucus for mm -hmm. a minute because people who attend caucus on a regular basis and truly listen to the, the um, legislative staffers who are presenting the details of a bill, um, I always worked hard to be in caucus, to ask questions, to have input, um, especially when we were in the majority. Mm -hmm. And frequently they would pull a bill back um, to you know, think about it some more, or to maybe offer some amendments when we were in the majority and controlled when bills were voted on. And that is a very important function of a member of the legislature, I think, sure. is to be active in your caucus, to present um, points of view that they might not be thinking about. To awareness, I guess, mm -hmm. um, about other points of view. And that's where perhaps women can be really instrumental in crafting legislation. Yeah. And I've always been very diligent about being in caucus, listening carefully to what bills were being talked about, offering my views, um, opposing bills that I thought were bad public policy, and, you know, supporting, you know, maybe, maybe pointing out, I remember particularly just very recently a member standing up and talking about a, a bill related to public utilities that we were going to be considering, which was really correcting some problems with, with legislation we passed several sessions ago. This was a new member and wasn't here then. Okay. So he didn't like some aspects of the bill. So I had been very instrumental in, in working on that bill back mm -hmm. then and offering mm -hmm. amendments. And actually some of my amendments were added in the Senate. They were rejected in the House, added in the Senate, and then we concurred on the Senate amendments. So that's how they got in the bill. But I stood up in caucus and pointed out to him that these were corrections to mistakes and it actually made things better for people. Okay. And that he really, you know, should rethink whether he's opposed to it or not based on that. So again, you know, that institutional knowledge, having been here over a period of time, having worked on these issues, um, it, it does seem as though a lot of candidates, first time candidates, talk about fresh ideas. Um, and I find that the ideas are only fresh because they're brand new to the process. A lot of these issues have been around for decades. Mm -hmm. We've worked on them for decades. The property tax issue is not new. There are no new ideas. <laughs> um, it's just a question of bringing the diverse interests together to find a solution. Right. Um, and the ballot questions that have been defeated about property taxes. Mm -hmm. If some of those had passed, we might not be where we are today. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, and if we would offer more money at the state level with regard to the budget for education, if we would fund it better from the state level, we wouldn't be pushing that burden back on the local property taxpayer so much. Mm -hmm. But again, this fresh ideas notion kind of makes me laugh because <laughs> We hear fresh ideas constantly right. um, from the lobbyists, from constituents. There are no dearth of fresh ideas, and some of the ideas, as I said, are only fresh because they're new. Right. Right. The people are new. The legislators are new, not because the ideas are new. Speaking of new legislators, um, as your years got later, um, did you see yourself as a mentor? to any of the, the, the new legislators that came in? Sure. Um, you develop an expertise in various topics, and um, I find that, yes, people would come to me and ask me questions, or, and 
just recently there have been a number of candidates um, for um, Democratic leadership okay. who've called me up and asked me for advice. Good. So yes, um, you know, I, I like to think that I was the kind of a legislator that could be respected mm -hmm. and that people valued my opinion. And yes, people, um, I tried to be, especially to the people who served on my committees mm -hmm. as when I was chairman of a committee. Um, yes, very definitely. Good. Um, now that you're, you're finishing up your final term, were there any particular issues um, that you fought hard for but, but um, unable to get, to get through or ones that you haven't even been able to, to touch yet? Well, tax fairness, okay. um, I think, is a huge one. Uh, closing the Delaware loophole through combined reporting. We are desperate in Pennsylvania for additional revenue. Mm -hmm. um, we have cut, we've cut the fat, we've cut the muscle, now we're into the bone. Mm -hmm. And there is, there are infrastructure issues that are going to come home to roost. You, you have to invest. Um, in order to to reap the benefits mm -hmm. um, and we have cut 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 and now we're at a point where I just don't know what you're going to do without some new revenue and it simply is not fair in my view that so many corporations pay nothing in state taxes um, we educate their workers we provide the infrastructure to get their goods and services to market mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of functions that state government performs that they rely on. And there are many, many um, services that we provide to, to businesses through various grant and loan funds, um, workforce development, and, and many, many other services that we provide that are paid for out of the state budget. And there are major corporations, wealthy corporations, that pay nothing in state taxes. So that burden falls back on individual taxpayers, and I think that is very unfair. And we need to reduce our too high corporate net income tax because those few people, those few companies that do pay it, are paying far more than they should because too many don't pay anything. So, you know, we need to lower the, the CNI, and you do that by closing those loopholes that allow tax avoidance of some of the wealthiest, biggest corporations in America. Hmm. And um, the other thing that I would point out um, is my early childhood education piece. We've laid the foundation. It's a strong foundation. We've gotten the partners together. But that is going to require a new investment. That is not something that we fund at high levels currently. And it is so preventive. They say you save $7 in future costs for every dollar you invest today in early childhood. Mm. Um, and, and we just haven't moved very far in the 24 years I've been in office and fighting and pushing and trying to move that issue forward. Pre-kindergarten, um, the zero to three age group, you know, for, especially for at-risk families, mm -hmm. um, absolutely crucial in terms of preventing problems later on. So, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we could do to help the elderly, family caregiver legislation that I did manage to get passed, um, but it doesn't go far enough. And it so saves, saves money you save in nursing home costs and assisted living costs sure. paid for through Medicaid. So again, you know, that would be very helpful to our state budget if we could invest in uh, providing better supports for family caregivers who are caring for elderly loved ones at home. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions um, to wrap up with regards to some general ideas and, and thoughts about your time in the House. Do you have a fondest memory um, or story, whether it was on the floor or off the floor? Oh, fondest memory. Not really. There are many, um, you know, I, I've really enjoyed floor debate. Mm -hmm. um, there are some YouTube examples of my floor debate that I'm really quite proud of. Um, 
fondest memories. I've been very close to some of my staffers. Yeah. Louise Stepanek um, and I were very close, and she was like a sister to me in many ways. Um, and th there were many, many fond memories uh, with her. And my committee work, you know, fond memories of being in the majority and able to actually move an agenda forward and, and accomplish something. Uh, fond memories in terms of my constituent work, okay. some of the problems that we managed to solve for people, um, some of the projects that I brought home to my district, the lands at Hillside Farms. I got a million dollars to help them buy that property mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, establish that nonprofit and do the work that they're doing, which is really remarkable. The Hoyt Library, when the roof collapsed because of snow, um, I was able to bring home a capital budget line item for them of a million dollars. There are many, many, as I look around my district and think about all the Little League fields, all the different um, projects, composting projects, recreation, parks, trails, there's so many um, projects that I brought back to the district um, that might not have ever been funded if it hadn't been for money that was available through grants. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the ribbon cuttings and um, interaction with constituents, there are many fond memories, but not one that I would single out as being the best. Any disappointments or regrets? Only in terms of what I have not been able to accomplish. Some of the work that I've pushed for and worked so hard on that did not um, get any traction. Sure. How would you like your tenure to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as somebody who worked hard, who did what I thought was right and let the political chips fall where they may, and somebody who, was, who tried to be fair to all the members of her committee. Mm -hmm. um, I actually got a very lovely uh, email from George Dunbar, um, who serves on, as a Republican on the Finance Committee just kind of pointing out that he, he really appreciated the fact that I was, would always come to my committee meetings in the minority prepared, mm -hmm. make good points, allow him as a majority member to hear an opposing point of view, mm -hmm. um, but in a respectful way. Sure. And um, so that's how I want to be remembered, as somebody who worked hard, tried to make a difference in a positive way, and um, try to do what I thought was right and let the political chips fall where they may. Do you have any retirement plans? Oh, sure. <laughs> I've already joined two book clubs. I've been kayaking a couple of times, which I never had the time to do before. Um, and I'll be joining some volunteer boards back in the community, Maternal and Family Health Services. I've already uh, agreed to join. Um, I got elected to the vestry of my church a couple of weeks ago, which was kind of a surprise, actually. But there are lots of volunteer opportunities and, and things to do back in the, in the area that I look forward to. Um, someone, well, some of the leaders of the Early Learning Investment Commission have suggested that I might want to try to get an appointment to that. And okay. so that would be uh, continuing my work on a state level with early childhood. So, and my 97-year-old dad um, needs me, yeah. and I'm sure I'll be able to see more of him now. Do you see yourself ever returning to the political realm? I hope not. <laughs> I truly hope not. Um, you know, I, as I said in the very beginning of this interview, I was sort of in a way dragged kicking and screaming into political life. It was never something I aspired to. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, the campaigning has been the most difficult part of my tenure. An election every other year. Mm -hmm. Nasty, name calling, misrepresenting my views, misrepresenting my votes, misrepresenting um, who I am as a person. And I was always grateful that my family didn't live anywhere near me because they didn't get to hear that. Right. So that has been the least favorite thing that I've been involved mm -hmm. in. And I was really, really looking forward to stepping back, 
being local, not caring so much about what was going on at the state level because now that's somebody else's problem. So with my attitude at the moment, probably not. But I, in a way, also felt called to do what I've done for the last 24 years. Um, I am deeply religious, and I believe that God calls you to do various things, and I think I was called to do this. And will he call again? Who knows? My final question for you is for someone who is interested in the political life. What advice would you give them? I'm coming out of an election where I was very disappointed in the voters. Um, I was disappointed that they elected Tom Wolf and then tied his hands in terms of who they elected to represent them in the legislature. And I was deeply disappointed um, in the outcome of the election in my district of the person to succeed me. So it's probably not the best time to be asking me for advice because with the political backstabbing on the part of my fellow Democrats that went on back in my district this year, um, I am not going to be encouraging any of my friends to put their name forward. Mm -hmm. It's just a very difficult life, mm -hmm. a very difficult life. Um, you're under attack as a person as opposed to what your views are. And, and that's hard. It's really hard. I think it's especially hard. You know, I look at Eileen Cipriani, who was running in the, in the election to succeed me. Her mother, her husband, her two children, her two boys had to listen to these lies about her um, put forth by the other side. That's tough. It's really tough. It, it is a calling, I think, and, but it takes an awfully thick sure. skin, which, frankly, I never developed. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm fr frankly, today, at this moment in time, I'm not in the mood to encourage anybody <laughs> to put their hat in the ring. I understand. Well, Representative Mundy, I want to thank you very much for giving me some time in your answers and your honesty. And I wish you nothing but good luck in your retirement. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.